Good evening, folks. Welcome back. This is your half hour call. Half hour, please. Half hour. Hi, everybody. This is Kurt Columbus, Artistic Director at Trinity Repertory Company. And I am here with you for your half hour call. My guest this evening, I'm so thrilled to have Sharon and Richard Jenkins, who are here with us. Sharon, Richard, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, Stephen Berenson, Brian McElhaney, uh, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, for those who don't know, Stephen and Brian are married. Richard and Sharon are married. We keep having married couples so I can get more people on a screen. Um, so everyone just know we're, we're respecting our quarantine. Um, tonight we're going to talk about what theater does that nothing else can. So I've got the perfect guests for that. We're going to start with a little clip from a production of Oklahoma that Richard and Sharon directed for us. And we'll go right to that, Peter, whenever you are ready, if you'll give us Oklahoma. <laughs> opening, um, I, I think that may be one of the first things that you talked to me about, Richard, Sharon. Um, what, where, talk about the genesis of that, because it's such a powerful image and, and it really sets us in the story so quickly. Well, the, you know, the, the, the stage direction saying Aunt Eller is going to be sitting on the stage with a butter churn. And, you know, we knew that wasn't going to happen. So, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I just wanted, I want, we wanted to set where we were in, right away. We wanted to set up this farm or this home, or we knew that she was going to be working in some fashion and we didn't want to bring out any kind of a set piece or anything that she would have to carry. And so uh, the image, and it happened very early in my head and I was, thinking about this today or the last couple of days is that for almost every show that I do, there's always kind of one image that I just am stuck with and I, it's gotta happen for me. And if it doesn't happen, then the whole show falls apart in my head at least. And this one was the clothesline wrapped around the girl doing the turn. It was just, as you see it, it is exactly how I imagined it and then because it was surprising, no one saw it coming. It just happened magically. And, and that's what I wanted it to be. And it was exactly what I wanted it to be. It's what theater can do. Exactly. Movies can't. Can't do it. <laughs> right. That's well, one of the things. Well, what, uh, Richard, talk about that just because I know that when you and I talked uh, last week or the week before, and you said uh, mm -hmm. it was kind of a founding principle for Adrian Halls, like what, um, who is the founder of our theater for those who don't know, um founding artistic director 
what 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 did he mean by that, or or what was your experience as a young actor with him? About him? well, what he meant, um, what makes us what what makes us valuable, what makes us different, what makes us special, and what can we do that movies can't? Because we can't compete with movies. I mean, around the world in eighty days, you can literally go around the world in eighty days. Um, you you can't you can't you know that they go to Rome, they shoot in Rome, uh, so. It's the actor in the audience. That's that's the basic thing that a live actor and a live audience. And he wanted to put the two as close as he could together. And, and Eugene too. They were they were both of them felt that way. That's why in Oklahoma, because we have platforms around the stage, that Eugene just wanted to turn the lights on mm -hmm. and say we're all in the same room together. Um, and you know, it, it's that's what Adrian was trying to do. And the other thing that, that theater can do that movies and television can't is that if an audience understands what's expected of them, they will go anywhere with you. In a movie, it has to be literal. In television, it has to be literal. Um, um, if it's the famous, I think it's a Peter Brook uh, from his book, uh, The Empty Space. If you say to an audience, this milk bottle is a baby, they'll go, okay. As long as they know what's expected of them, they will go with it. And so the naturalism in the, in the way of, of scenery and all of that stuff was um, something Adrian and Eugene fought against for the longest time. There's a much more interesting way to do it. Like that example you just gave that Sharon had the dress and the clothesline. It's how do you do this in a way that, that is only possible in the theater? Yeah, I, the story that I always remember uh, being told to me early on was that um, that in in a play, you know, the actors were supposed to go to a doctor's office. And one of the actors said, "Adrian, there's no scenery to tell the audience that we're going to a doctor's office. How will they know?" And he went, "Well, they, you will say we need to go to the doctor, and then and then and then we'll go, and then we'll get there and say, doctor." what's wrong with me and the doctor will treat you. And that's how they will know we're in a doctor's office. It, it's, right? you know, it's, it's the tradition, some traditions of the theater he just fought against constantly, like scene changes. He hated right. them. He hated them more than, he hated <laughs> scene changes uh, so much. And, and because he said, you know, it, it, the play stops. Who are we kidding when we turn the lights off? We know what they're, we hear people bump on walls and glow tape everywhere. And, he said, there's a, got to be a better way to do this. To, if you want to change the environment you're in, how do you do it? How do you make it part of the piece? And that was, uh, you, you know, and, and it's, he discovered, for me, coming out of a, a college, it was incredible because it was, it, I was along with everybody else going, oh my God, the theater can do this. And we never do it. We never do it. It's always naturalism. It's always, you, you know, um, uh, pretending that there's really a door there, that there's really a, that, 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 that there's, there's really trees outside, you know, right. they have the, the windows with the, with the fake trees. I mean, it's just is, it's, you're competing on a level you can't compete with. You can't compete with it with film on that level. So why try? That was That's just, right. That's right. Um, so that I, I'm <laughs> going to actually go right into our next clip. Peter, I think I'd like to go right to this, um, brilliant production of The Grapes of Wrath that Brian McElhaney directed that Stephen Berenson was in. Um, and we'll just roll the clip.
right. That's it. That's what I'm talking about. Right. That's that, so that's, a, you know, it, that's that iconic image of the Jodes getting into their truck to go across the country. It's the filmic image. And Brian, you did none of that. <laughs> you no. you did you did it and didn't do it. Can and yet you... we did it, you know, and it, you know, I I've been in addition to being an actor and director all my life, I've also been a teacher. And for a long time, it took me a little while to figure out that I was having my most wonderful theatrical experiences in acting classes because of course you're invested in the people and that's why we have companies, but also because you have to invest completely imaginatively. You don't have costumes, you don't have sets, you don't have anything. And the more that you ask people to invest their imaginations, the more they will and the more they'll feel. I, I really, really, really believe this. And if, um, and if you do it all for them and they just kind of sit back and wait for more and more and more to kind of happen to them, the less they feel. And it becomes yeah. all about spectacle and that's not, <laughs> I, I remember talking when we did this production, it was adapted by the great Frank Galati. And I remember talking to Galati and having him say, oh, I, I, and I told him, well, we're, you know, we're, we're not going to have a car. And in the Steppenwolf production that went to Broadway, there was a car, there was a river the, you know, the, the, the actual car drove on stage and people got on it. And I talked to him about your idea for the show and the live band on stage. And he said to me, I remember being in the rehearsal hall when nothing I, when I had nothing but muscle and bone. And that was when it was truly great. And I always felt like it never was as great as that. And so all you had here was muscle and bone, right? And you, and you know that they're going to take this epic journey just because all of those people come together I, I, and, and then I just want to talk about the fact that, that it all happened right around the audience, right? The audience is right there. And Stephen, you were there every night doing the show in between those little tables. What is that like? Well, it's different every night because your audience is different every night and they're staring at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they speak sometimes, you know, they get involved. Uh, they have things to say they want to share with you while you're running around trying to get your props. Uh, and um, yeah, you know, there's, there's, there's the famous story about being in uh, Christmas Carol and it was Danny Welch actually was flying and he was up above and there was a little kid in the audience who was freaking out because there was a guy flying up there and he was crying and very upset. And I think it was his teacher said to him, uh, it's okay, don't worry, it's just make-believe. And this little boy said, it ain't make-believe, he's up there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, the suspension of disbelief takes you a long way. Yeah. And there's something incredible about the human muscle and blood and sweat of people doing things and making things in front of you, which is very different than seeing a bunch of scenery. Scenery right, right. can't act and scenery can't sweat and scenery can't speak or feel or do any of the things that actors do. And the more the actors can do it, the better it is. And, and, I learned from you and to, think, to think that one in two minutes, we're going to build a car in front of you without wheels, without steering wheels, without seat, but you're gonna know it's a car. Now that, I mean, that's theatricality in the best sense of the word. That's really what the theater can do that movies can, you know? And he just did that. Right. It's like, um, uh, we did the, the Surrey in, um, yeah. in, uh, in Oklahoma, Oklahoma the same way. We, we did it with shadows and, and uh, uh, it, it, but we did it in front of the, we, we built it once with, while they were watching it. But right. uh, but Brian does this all the time when he directs. I mean that that's what he does. He it's it he understands what the theater can do, and um, it just most people just don't ever do it. Well, I no. think, and I think that part of the you know, I I know that you all feel this way because we're all cut from the same aesthetic sheet of pasta. Um, it, it's we don't tell stories like this in order to be clever. We tell stories like this in order to, one, 
make the senses of the audience wake up, lean in, watch a story perhaps that they feel that they know, that they've heard, but to hear it again for the very first time, right? Um, and, it, and so there's that, and it's also because in this kind of novel storytelling, what, what happens is that the, the, um, the event that can only happen in the theater creates a space for me to listen in a different way. I mean, I, I really believe that when you listen to Surrey with a fringe on top, if it's taking place in front of you in a completely new way, you hear it yes. new, right? Right, right, mm -hmm. right. Well, and I, there's, there's um, I remember this from Richard from doing Twelfth Night. And we were, you know, how many productions of Twelfth Night are there? And Richard's saying in the rehearsal hall, the only reason to do this play again is to make it our Twelfth Night and the best Twelfth Night that we can do. And within that production, there's an iconic moment, which I'm going to point to, which is when they, there are twins in the production mm -hmm. and they never look alike. Um, there are always two actors dressed the same and the it's audience- It's a male and a female. Yeah, you know, Brother and sister twins. Suspension of disbelief. I don't, I don't believe these two people are twins because they're never twins. And, and they try, they try to put fake noses on them and yeah. Of course, you should tell us no, what you did, Richard. Tell what you did. Tell, tell oh, your well, how you saw it. I actually tried. We thought about hair the same. I got, I fell into the same trap that I, I rail against all the time. And then one day I just thought, oh, this is. So we had a big crossover, and the two came out during the crossover, and we froze, and they turned to the audience standing right next to each other. And we held a sign up behind them and said, these two look exactly alike, okay? <laughs> and, and the audience loved it. And there was never an issue with it. They never, and it's like, if they understand what's expected of them, they will, right. they will go with it. And, and, and you also let them in on something. Yeah. You know, is Adrian, make them, a, this is for them. Yeah. When we, we did Project Discovery shows and the kids hated it he would say, it's not their fault, it's ours. Nice. And that's when he started to go out in the audience with cannons and <laughs> ropes. And, you know, it's like we, what he was saying to them, we know you're there. We want you to be a part of this. Uh, we're doing this for you. This isn't a movie. Yeah. And uh, I mean, a, his aesthetic kind of grew out of those high school shows yeah. that were started off being just a nightmare. Yeah, and um, and yeah. and ended up with these kids just eating it up and loving um, coming. I mean, people stopped me for years saying, "I, I was there the night the cannon went off behind my head," and you know, <laughs> it's that um, you know, it's that thing that they can't get anywhere else. That's right. Um, hey, Peter, will you roll the um, the uh, photos from Macbeth for us, please? Just from a production that Richard did. Uh, in the 90s. Um, and uh, these are some still photographs. You know, Tim Crow. Tim. Annie Scaria. So beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, David Jones. Oh. Ed Shea. Yep. Oh, Davy. <laughs> How beautiful he looks. Davy. <laughs> Yeah, Ricardo. Ricardo. Yeah. Ricardo. And that's Brian writhing, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's me and Phyllis. Yeah, that's you and Phyllis. That's right. Yes, yes. Brian with Brian's breasts. <laughs> um, and there you can see the, uh, the, you see those slats in there. That's the, those yeah. are the sections. I want, to, put in. I want to talk about this floor. I just, I love that our friend Ricardo Pitzwiley. And our friends Annie Scaria and Tim Crow are in there. It's just so beautiful to see them. Annie Welsh. Well, you, Richard, you you said the floor had held meaning for you, even if it didn't hold specific well, meaning for everyone. But I, I had forgotten what what the meaning was. <laughs> it's been so long ago. But Brian reminded me just now. And what was it, Brian? That the line that the witches say. The earth has bubbles in it. Earth has yeah. bubbles in it. And so about halfway through, I don't know, it was a long time into rehearsal. They were building the set already. And I said, can we get the floor to move? Um, 
And David Rotundo was the designer, I think, mm -hmm. is David. And David, man, he's game. And so they built these rectangle squares, um, um, shapes with slats in them that the light would come up. And they would just, they placed them like this. They weren't secured. Mm -hmm. So, and then they would get under the stage and, and go around and knock them up with sticks. And so they would rise and fall. And rise. It looked like uh, um, white caps or it looked like bubbles. It looked like the earth was literally moving. And, um, you know, it was just one of those things that, as Sharon and I were talking today, you know, in the theater, like anything else in the arts, as soon as you make a decision, the creative process dies. It's dead. <laughs> Once you say, I want a window there, you're stuck with that <laughs> crummy window. window. Yeah. And there's, but, but the longer you can hold off, and it's hard because they have to build a set and they have to do the costumes, and, but, the longer you hold off on decisions like that, the better off you are because they seem to solve themselves sometimes. And that's what the floor, we did that with the floor. But it, you know, it, it, it's like, you wanna give your actors, I think of the witches, you guys were, were I mean, I, 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 have some, I loved that production. I, I love Annie and Timmy in it. I just thought it was, I, it was terrifying. It was terrifying because it, you saw where Tim went and Annie was terrified that her husband went to this place that she had no idea that that's where he was going to go after she had asked him, after she had pushed him. So it was just really cool. And, um, um, and I am 73 and I don't remember what I'm talking about. What, what was my... <laughs> You're had a... talking about the way the floor moved. And I, oh, yeah. I, I think, yeah. you know, oh, no, this is... Oh, and, and the, the other thing, just a quick thing. Um, yeah. Uh, scene changes. We had a table. Uh, I think we, we saw it was the huge table, and it left. And it, you had to. We got eight actors picking it up and walking off, it, which is like you know, count it to 20, 30, a minute and a half, two minutes. It's like what? So we built a um, um, we built like a, a trap. trap door underneath the the uh, table, and I think the witches danced around the table if I'm not, and did something oh, like this. Thing. Yep, yeah, and, and the trap door opened and this table, which was huge, just crashed down below. And uh, so it became part of the piece. It wasn't a scene change. It was part of this world that we had created. So I, that, I, like that. No, I, I, lo I love talking about this and I wanna segue us um, to talking about how with this idea, how nothing is a separate element in a Trinity Rep show, right? Music, choreography, uh, acting, it's all happening together. Um, I wanna stop for a second though and say, we're going to take questions after we show a couple more clips and have a little bit more conversation. So anyone who's watching, you can ask your questions in the comments section of Facebook Live and they'll get to us. Um, thank you for watching. Um, we'll get to as many as we can get to. Uh, so I remember, um, Sharon, when you and Stephen Berenson and I were doing Merchant of Venice together. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and someone said to me, why do you have a choreographer for Merchant of Venice? Mm -hmm. And I said, because Sharon's one of the greatest theatrical thinkers that I know. And I, yes. I think all four of us would agree that you are truly one of the great theatrical thinkers. I, I have to agree. <laughs> <laughs> she is though, she, she actually uh, is. She is, and part of it is because your choreography is not distinct from um, the urge to tell the story with the acting, with, um, with the, the bodies in space. Um, it's not a separate element, right? I want to play well, a clip yeah. um, from Oliver, but what were you going to say? Well, I, I, I have always, I, I, it, you know, I can watch an old musical and I can watch, uh, you know, a movie musical and I, I can get when they just break into a song. I just have found it very hard to always do that in the theater. For me, it has to come from a very human place. Yeah. I, it just has to come from the event and the people and it has to be right for them. It can't just be something I put on it. I mean, even though I do kind of put it, you know, but I try to take it from 
where it's where it's coming from. She has actually said in rehearsals, I don't think okay, Sharon, you go ahead and do this number. She says, I don't think they're ready to dance yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's well, okay. Yeah. This is exactly can I just say one more thing. I know we're gonna show the clip, yeah. but I also want to say that what happens in the rehearsal room when we're rehearsing a scene is exactly what happens when Sharon is choreographing. Yeah. And yeah. she will never let anybody look stupid. You know, it's not, <laughs> I mean, it's true. You, you are not as, um, uh, uh, you don't have the sense of ownership of your movement so much as you have a sense of ownership of the actors being able to embrace your movement. And the yeah, story. I mean, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, Peter, let's play this clip from Oliver because it's Steven Berenson, unrecognizable actually, at Vegas. <laughs> oh, another glamour role. Yeah. yeah. So here we go. When I see someone rich, both my thumbs start to itch, only to find some peace of mind. I have to pick a pocket or two. You got to pick a pocket or two. <laughs> You've got to pick a pocket or two. Just to find that peace of mind, you have to pick a pocket or two. Let's show Oliver how it's done, my dears. Dear old gent passing by, something nice takes his eye. Everything's clear, attack for ear, and I'm to pick a pocket or two. You've got to pick a pocket or two. Doors are so useful, aren't they? I'm not dropping a great. table into them. <laughs> well, yeah, it's funny because that's an interesting that we that set was given to us. Yes. Yeah. Because it was a Christmas Carol set. It was actually Stephen's idea to do both Christmas Carol and Oliver on the same set. But it's a that's like how do you do a play in your living room? How do you do a play where I don't get to ask if I right. uh, the trap door was there? Yeah. And Everything so you was. Yeah. yeah, no, and the, uh, I, it's funny because when we were putting this clip together, I had ended it when the, um, uh, when the, what a crook, and Peter said, no, 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 you have to, you have to use the trap door because the trap right. door is funny and it yeah. buttons yeah. the whole thing. And he's right. And, and it's just because it was there, you used yeah. it. Yeah. It's such a great example of the, you, you know, here you are working with children. Yeah. Um, and and it, and Stephen, I I love your portrayal in this because he's such a psychopath. He really is. He's 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 a he's the worst kind of sociopath, right? And and I and Richard and Sharon talked about Fagan like that from the beginning, and I was like, you're absolutely right. This is a guy who uses children to pick pockets, right? Yeah, yeah. I I'll tell you what theater does that nothing else can do. Looking at that clip. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, that was that was 
um, my, mostly my hair and my beard. And then there was a wig on top and the babushka that held it all together. And we were doing that song one night and, um, and Noah Parrots, who played mm -hmm. Dodger, was suddenly next to me as we were going through the scene. And I, I couldn't understand, but everywhere I moved, Noah moved with me. <laughs> and I looked over at him finally and there was abject terror in his face. <laughs> and I realized that as he had been picking my pocket, his sleeve button had gotten caught in my wig. Uh. <laughs> and he couldn't get it out. And uh, his one hand, he was trying to get it out. So I thought, oh, I, I'll take care. I'm a professional, <laughs> I can do this. So wow. I, I tried to get it out and I couldn't get it out. And I'm pulling on it and you know, I'm looking like Mae West or Veronica Lake trying to, um, and, uh, and then I thought, well, I just have to rip it. And so I tried to rip it and I couldn't get it out and I ripped <laughs> it, I ripped it. And finally it ripped. And the wig kind of fell over in front of my face, like like I was a pirate or something. I, I couldn't see out of one eye. And I sort of pushed the whole thing back and just hoped it would stay for the next half hour till I got off stage. And you were both there that night. I remember and so, that. I remember and, that. and you yeah. both came backstage and I and I Richard came to my dressing room and I said, um, how was pick a pocket or two? Did you notice anything? <laughs> how did I look? <laughs> Richard said, like a deer in the headlines. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, what can theater do that it can really mess you up? <laughs> there are no retakes, and you are in that moment dealing with whatever you're dealing with and um, and hoping that you can get through it. <laughs> I, I no, those kids, those kids were so they were fantastic. So fantastic. All I don't think kids. I don't think I've ever worked with a group of kids that was that serious and that um, focused. And they were not any older than other groups of kids that we've used for other shows. Right. But, and they were, there was maybe three of them or two of them, two, two of the girls who actually had dance training. Um, the others, especially the other two young men didn't. But Noah, who played Dodger was invaluable there. He really kind of set the tone even though he was older than the others, and although he was smaller, so he didn't look bad, but he was um, very kind to them and very, um, but he, just by example, they just kind of fell in line and they were, they just wanted to do They were amazing kids. They wanted to be good. Well, and I think Noah had just done the tour of Billy Elliot, right? Yes, yes. And your Oliver was... Yes. I mean, we got so lucky I mean, with those two kids. I mean, what do you do if you, uh, hot dicks? I mean, just amazing the children we had. And, yeah. And Oliver, he was amazing. Yeah. I, I just remember going, uh, you, you were rehearsing one day and um, uh, going upstairs, and he's sitting there eating his little snack and just <laughs> winded because he's been dancing for an hour. And I said, You doing okay, bud? And he's like, I'm fine. I'm like, wow, all right. <laughs> I know I know 50 year olds that wouldn't be that self-possessed. You know, one um, of the one of the moments I remember in that show that I loved, which is very much in sync with what we're talking about, was Phineas, who played Oliver, and um and his journey from um to London. Mm -hmm. And Stephen Thorne stood there with a sign that said to London. Mm -hmm. And Phineas just walked and then two members of the cast came with kind of a big rubber belt and Phineas walked into it and they held him back and moved around so that he was walking in different directions and then I can't remember maybe it was Stephen had leaves and threw leaves yeah. up in the air yeah. and you know and the sign kept changing direction until finally it pointed to the steps downstage yeah. center and Phineas yeah. sat down on the steps right and that journey was so inventive and so mm -hmm. entertaining and such great storytelling. So thank you, Sharon. <laughs> yeah, such great storytelling. Uh, uh, Jordan Butterfield, our education director, just wrote in and said, the kids from Oliver are actually now seniors in high school, just as- Oh, no. Well, yeah. and, and, and Noah, you know, our, our lovely Dodger, um, I believe is now a company member with the Royal Winnipeg Ballet. Uh, oh, how great. He's a really wonderful dancer. So we have dozens of questions and I want to get to them. I want to play one more clip though, which is from our production 
that closed right at the beginning of all of this, A Tale of Two Cities. And I want to play the last little bit, Peter, if you'd do that for me. This is from A Tale of Two Cities, the final <laughs> moment. If the moment's come. Keep your eyes upon me. Look upon no other object. I shall mind nothing. They will be wrapped. Fear not. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He who believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whomsoever liveth and believeth in me will never die. I see the lives for which I lay down my life, peaceful, useful, prosperous, and happy in that England which I shall see no more. I see her with her child upon her bosom, safe and without fear. I see her father, aged and bent, but otherwise restored and at peace. I see Mr. Lorry, so long their friend, in 10 years time, passing tranquilly to his reward. I see her an old woman, weeping for me on the anniversary of this day. I see her and her husband, their course done, lying side by side in their last earthly bed, knowing that I was in the souls of both. I see that child who lay upon her bosom grown into a woman, bringing her own son, a boy of my name, to this place. And I hear her tell that child my story. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. About the city that night, they said of him that it was the peacefulest man's face ever beheld there. Many added that he looked sublime and prophetic. better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. So great. That's Danny Duque Estrada, our newest company member. Um, and it, it, it just, it's related, Stephen, to the thing that you were just talking about. I mean, years go by, the, the, you, you're no longer in Paris, you're in London, the sweep of the thing, time passes, and, and you have a guillotine made out of a paper cutter and people standing on tables. And, you know, Brian, that was your adaptation. I mean, it, it, it's, it's all part of this lineage, right? Oh yes, I didn't make any of this up. I learned all of this from Adrian and Dick and from being a member of this company for 30 mm -hmm. years. <laughs> um, and we've learned how to do this. We've learned how actors can tell stories um, and tell it simply and directly and fully and um, imaginatively and not depend on anything but what we have at hand in the space with the audience. It's funny, uh, this one of the, that you just answered, one of the questions was, Wondering if you feel like Adrian's iconic style and legacy as Trinity's first artistic director informed all of your various directing styles and does it still today? And it does, right? That lineage. Absolutely. 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 I mean, uh, there were things that I didn't like that I changed. And there are things that people work with me don't like that they changed. But yes, the, the idea, and, and I have to put Eugene in this too, because Eugene really was, he, he, you needed some Eugene, you know, it was this was the time of Peter Brook and Jersey Grotowski and and the theater was looking away from um, prosceniums and and um, not saying that I don't love a good proscenium because uh, I do. But um, <laughs> this is where we were going in, in regional theater in, in Providence. And uh, 
um, he, he was, Adrian was just an enormous um, influence on me as a director. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you're absolutely right to point at uh, Eugene and his just lasting influence. I mean, oh, yeah. 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 all of my greatest work is with Eugene. I, I think of that, right? Yeah. You know, we, we have all kinds of uh, great work together. Um, Stephen, uh, Pam Erskine um, wrote and asked, does the Fagan role rank among your favorites because you were fabulous? That's very sweet. Thank you, Richard and Sharon, for making me fabulous. <laughs> um, and Tom Jones, actually, for helping me with my voice. Um, yes, it certainly it does. Um, you know, Brian directed me in Death of a Salesman, and that was a favorite. And Kurt, you directed me in Merchant of Venice, and that was a favorite. So. I look. No, I, I've and and Sharon and I work together on Cabaret, mm -hmm. so um, I'm I'm lucky. I get to work with a lot of great directors and some very good parts. Uh, but yes, that was a favorite. Uh, I was supposed to play it in high school, <laughs> and then they switched over to Camelot, and ah. so it <laughs> lived in my past somehow. Um, so uh, th there's um, a question. Uh, is there a play you have acted in or directed that reminds you in any way of the feeling experiences we are currently in the midst of from Kathy Hickman? Well, that's a really good question. Waiting for Godot. <laughs> uh, uh, you, yeah, you could change the last word to vaccine and um, that's kind of what we're waiting for. Um, I don't, I, I, this is new territory for me, for all of us, I think. Yeah, yeah I mean, you'll, you'll look, I, I was having this conversation with Stephen and I'm with Kurt a couple of weeks ago. Everything seems like it should be done right now. I mean, I think of A Tale of Two Cities, which we just finished and it was something that was for the time it was done, but a play about actually being in history in a cataclysmic moment in history and you don't know where it's going and you don't know how it's gonna end and you don't know who's gonna win and who's gonna lose. And that's what being in history is. And that's what Tale of Two Cities was. I wish I could do it again because it, I mean, all of those people in that world have that same feeling. Something incredible is happening and we don't know what it's gonna be like on the other side. And Kathy, this this isn't one we have done, but um, you know we're we're going to do when we get back in that building. God damn it, we're going to do uh, the Diary of Anne Frank. And Brian and I have been talking about this, and I've been reading it. And here you have this girl, this young girl, who is in a kind of isolation that none of us can even begin to comprehend. Right? I mean, they never left that attic for years yeah. and and uh, she she finds such hope it's it's astonishing right you read you go back and you read the text of that and there's so much hope and joy and possibility she doesn't ever let it diminish her i i, I so i've been thinking about that one yeah, she's. I mean, she does what we all. We were having this conversation just yesterday. She she lives in the moment. She says, "This is my life now, mm -hmm. and I have to live it." And this is our life now, and we can't think, you know, oh, I wish I were back in the before times, or I'll really be living when this is over. This is right. our lives, and this yeah. is what we have. So we yeah. got to find a way to live in it all the time. Yeah. yeah. So that actually is great. A great segue to the next question from Chris Donahue. My question to all would be this, isn't it true that live theater can really only do what life itself does? That is to say, things happen that we cannot expect in a performance any more than we can sometimes in life. And it allows us to learn new things because we have to imagine another person's experience and develop empathy along the way. We witness theater as a group as we do our own lives in society. Wow. That's a really good one. That's a lot. A yeah. lot. And that's a lot to do with the power of acting. What does it yeah. do? What does it mean to actually step into somebody else's shoes and live their life? And what is it to ask an audience to step into somebody's shoes and live their life? I mean, it's a very powerful thing that 
theater but, and movies do it too, but acting does it. And but it's, it, there, it. there's, I, I uh, the thing that I think you have to believe if you're an actor, that there's, there's a common understanding between human beings. Hmm. And if you can touch that, if you can, if you can trust yourself enough not to try to explain it or to show it or to wish for it, but just to live your life on the stage or in the film, that you, I believe that there's a common, that you will touch people, that people will understand. Mm. Um, and that is, it's kind of, we're all in this together. I mean, that's what the theater is, you know, for, even for two hours, if it's a brilliant night in the theater, there, that, that's interesting about the theater because when it's great, there's nothing greater. Yeah, yeah. And when it's bad, there's nothing worse. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, maybe I shouldn't be saying, but, but no. you know, I, I people, it's, it's hard to get people who leave the theater to come back. Movies, you can see eight crappy movies in a row. And it's like, yeah, yeah I'll go again. There, there is a commitment from an audience in the theater that is, it, it's special. And it's, when it works, there is nothing like it for the actor and the audience. Mm -hmm. There is nothing like it. And it's, it's a common understanding that we're all humans and, and I don't care what culture we come from, but we do share so many things. And um, I, I, as an actor, you have to believe that. Yeah. But I think most really good actors do. I, I do. I do really love this focus on the audience experience because I think it is something mm -hmm. that that um, those of us who love the theater love watching it just going and watching it I mean you know um, uh, Stephen and I both lead sort of theater groups that go and watch theater and um, the people that do that they, they, they love it so much and and it's not just vacationing. They they love that, right? It's it's it, it is absolutely heartbreaking for someone in the theater to know that an audience didn't like or didn't connect with what they're doing. Right. That's why we do it. It's that's. I mean, I can't write. I can't paint. I can't play an instrument. This is the way I connect. And when. It's like when somebody says, well, I didn't like it. The first thing an actor hears is, you don't like me. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, you, it, it's, I didn't do my job. I didn't do what I wanted to do. I didn't, um, it's easy to blame them, but the truth is it's, it's usually on you, but it's, um, it's a very powerful um, medium at its best. Well, and it's the power of company too, that I, I do think it's one of the great things about Trinity, that there's a company and that people are invested in telling a story together. And, you know, sometimes we have wonderful, delicious roles, and sometimes we have very small roles, and everybody is still working the same path to make a, um, uh, an immediate experience for a group of people who are there only that night. Um, mm -hmm. They're one time seeing it. And well, sometimes people come more than once, but you know, you have to go into it saying, this is it. And, um, and I'm not going to give my opening night performance. I'm going to give my best performance. And yeah. as a company, if you feel that moving forward, and if you've rehearsed the right way, you can move forward. That's um, mutually empowering. And it doesn't just have to be a company like Trinity, where you could see it, you see it with people who've never worked together before, but have the leadership and the desire to create a piece of art together without pushing each other out of the way to get center stage. And then you sometimes see it with people who've not worked together before and nothing's going on. <laughs> There's, um, I still remember, again, going back to Merchant of Venice, because um, I was there that day, Stephen, that you know, we had this group of about 70 kids who had studied the play in their um, civics class, in their world history class. And they staged their own versions of Merchant of Venice. And they, um, they read the play 
And then when they got to the section where Shylock is describing why, wherefore doth he hate me, they wrote their responses of why people hate them. And this incredibly moving, you know, um, what, horrible things that people had said to them over their lives. Um, and I remember standing in the back watching that and just weeping because they're responding to a piece of art, but they're responding to it in such a personal way. Yeah. And then we watched the performance where um, that class came and they were sitting right um, in the front and Stephen got to the monologue and you had that, you had that little pause, wherefore doth he hate me, right? And there's a little pause and one of the kids, young African-American kid said, because I am a Jew. And mm -hmm. Stephen went to the audience, because I am a Jew. And that's the kind of thing that can only happen in the live theater because in that moment, Stephen knew to not to just plow on with the speech, but in fact, to accept the gift that was being given and then share it with the audience. And it's, it's, that, that's beautiful, but I would say it, it, somebody should have paid that kid. That's not a <laughs> I did. I did. It was Stephen's job. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, in, terms of, in terms of the Trinity rep moment, yeah. where it took that monologue out of the scene yeah. at the end of the act, thank you very much, and brought up the house lights. And that's about as Trinity rep as you get. Yeah. Um, so one last question. We talk about the Trinity style. Do you all think it's important for different regional theaters to have their own unique flavor? Why or why not? I think it's important for everybody to have their own unique flavor. <laughs> I agree. Every, every, every artist, actor, designer, director, costumer, dancer, singer. I just think that's, that's what makes the world go round. Yeah. Yeah, in the arts. I mean, th th this this aesthetic is, you know, it changes and it grows and it's not the same as it was 10 years ago. It wasn't the same. It's not the same as when I was there. And it was Oscars wasn't the same as yours isn't the same as Oscars. It's everybody puts their 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 life into it. And that's what you, that's all I ask yeah. is let me see you, what you, Kurt, want to do here. What do you think of this? How do you see this? Same with the performance. Brian, Stephen, how do you Sharon, with with, you know. Um, it's, it's a collaborative effort, even with dancers with Sharon. Yep. I mean, most dancers, their whole lives, they told what to do and they do it. Mm -hmm. Sharon asks their opinion and they all go, what, 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 what did you say? Yep. You want to know what I think? Well, a lot of them, <clears throat> uh, you know, are in a, a more traditional musical theater where they're, they're just, they go into a show and the dance captain tells them what to do and they just do it. So they're, they're, they really want to to help and, and participate and be part of the and, process. And well, and, and, and what a waste if it's someone like the, the beautiful and talented Tavon Gamble, who's in that Oklahoma opening with Shura Barishnikov. And that, that guy is such a wonderful collaborator. Oh, yes, he's great. Right? And great. they're yeah. in the tale of two cities now. I mean, he, he, it turns out if you just think he's just a dancer because he's a beautiful and brilliant dancer, what a what a horrible way to um, miss out on all of that other talent, Bri, What were you? You had something you wanted. I was, to gonna, I was going to agree with Dick that all artists have to have a point of view, have to have a set of I call them ethical responsibilities to their art. They say this is what I want it to be, and because we're a company, we're not all the same at all. But our points of view tend to overlap a lot, which is mm -hmm. making what makes us function as a company and is what has propelled the history of Trinity Rep. So that it's not just people doing a different show, 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 but that there is in fact a history and a through line and a point of view that is definable. If Well, it's recognizable if it's not definable. Yes, yeah. I would agree. So um, we're winding down here. Uh, your half hour call always turns into an hour call because we take questions. So. Um, I really appreciate that everyone's here. If you're interested in seeing more from Brian and Stephen, um, you can, and, and others in our resident acting company, you can visit our show goes on page. Um, and there's uh, Shakespearean sonnets. There's 
great uh, Trinity Rep Radio Theater classics that are listed there. Um, so please, please visit the Show Goes On page. Uh, we're looking forward to being together with you again in the fall. Uh, we are selling subscriptions. We are going to get back on that stage as soon as we possibly can, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, you know, there's a recording of this episode uh, and other stuff online, um, but there will be nothing like the live experience. Um, I do want to say our donors have been amazing over the last couple of months. Um, they've kept our staff Great. fed and whole, and it's been really incredible. There's going to be a little donation button at the end of this. Um, follow that link. It's on our page as well. Um, if you'd like to keep supporting Trinity Rep and keep us going. Um, we're also offering online classes all through the summer. The June classes are now enrolling. So check out the webpage for that. And next week on your half hour call, we're going to be talking about new plays and new playwriting um, we'll have George Brandt with us, the mm -hmm. author of The Prince of Providence um, and uh, several other plays at Trinity Rep. Lauren Yee is going to join us and the director, Tavi McGar, and our director of new play development, Tyler Dabrowski. Um, so to wrap us up, we're going to play just the most lovely little clip from our company member, Mia Ellis, to talk about a moment in the live theater. Peter, whenever you're ready, roll that clip. Thanks for being here. Hi everyone, I'm Mia Ellis and I've been a company member for seven years and my behind the scenes story happened during To Kill a Mockingbird where I shared a dressing room with Rebecca Gibble, AKA Becky. Um, so normally, during a show, I waited till about five minutes until the start of the show before I put my costume on. It's just easier that way. Um, I usually have my hair and makeup done and my costume is the last thing. So on this particular day, I was coming back from the bathroom and went to open the dressing room door. It's five till the start of the show <laughs> and I can't get the door open. I try again and the door still won't open. Now, I know I've not had any problems with this door before and I know I know how to open a door. So I try a third time and the door still doesn't open. And at that point, Becky realizes something is wrong and she comes over to the door and I tell her that the door is stuck and that she's got to try it from inside the dressing room to open it. And she tries and the dressing room door still doesn't open. At that point, everyone realizes something is wrong. Stage management comes over. They try to open the door and the door still won't open. And then someone has an amazing idea to um, have Becky climb over the dressing room wall into the dressing room next to ours, which is only possible because the Chase Theater dressing rooms, um, there is a space between the ceiling and the top of the dressing room wall. So Becky jumps into action. She grabs my costume and shoes, throws them over the wall, then pulls herself up and over the wall <laughs> to safety. <laughs> She is uninjured. She's a little dusty, but she's she's fine. I grab my costume, go get changed, and the show starts. <laughs> I I just some of the things that happen. There's so many surprises that come along, but um, that one sticks out to me the most. Um, yeah, I hope you all enjoyed that story. I hope you're safe, and um, thank you for watching and for supporting Trinity Rep. All right, take care. Move, I guess. Thank you, everyone. Good show. That is it for this week. We are back again next week at the same time. Once again, we are back here next Thursday evening for a 7.30 p.m. half hour. Thank you so much. Have a great night and a great week.